register there online as well. Luke chapter 19, and I'm going to begin reading the story of Palm Sunday, beginning in verse 28. Luke says, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where, as you enter, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves." And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. The Holy Spirit has a word of life and hope to speak to us today from the story of Palm Sunday. And my message is entitled, Today is Your Day. Today is your day. Let's pray and invite the Spirit of the Lord to come and minister from the Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' great name, and we thank you for giving us your Word. It is truly a lamp for our feet, and it is the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the Word of God is like seed. So, Father, we open our hearts to you right now. We ask that our hearts might be good soil to receive and retain and bear fruit from the seed of the Word of God. Jesus said the words that he speaks to us are spirit and life. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and minister life to us from the scriptures this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, we have just read Luke's account of a scene which is familiar to every Christian. And it's a powerful picture. The ministry of Jesus is reaching its climax. Passover is nearing, and Jerusalem is filling up with pilgrims from all over the Roman Empire and beyond. At Passover, every Jewish man was required to come to the temple and celebrate how God had delivered Israel from slavery centuries before. Obeying that command, the faithful were flowing toward the city by the tens of thousands. As the feast drew closer, they would swell Jerusalem from an already chaotic 80,000 or so people to perhaps a quarter of a million. They would turn David's city into a hotbed of devotion mixed with resentment and hatred for the Roman occupiers. This was the most exciting Passover Jerusalem had seen in centuries. There had been a rising tide of anticipation for years now. First, John the Baptist had come, seemingly out of nowhere, telling Israel to prepare the way because the Lord was about to appear. 
John had a massive impact on the nation. And the Gospels tell us that everyone was wondering if perhaps he might be the Messiah. But John said, no, somebody is coming after me who is mightier than I am. I'm not worthy to untie his shoe, and I have come to bear witness of him. And then as John predicted, the ministry of Jesus broke forth and every day saw a new miracle, another demonstration of the love of God through the hands of the master. Every time Jesus taught, every time he confronted his adversaries, the crowds heard fresh wisdom. They heard heavenly words never before spoken on this earth. The authority of God was administered through his command and the power of God was released as he touched the leper and the outcast. John's ministry had been surrounded by excitement, but the ministry of Jesus set Israel on fire. His detractors were plotting against him because they said the whole world has gone after him. But the common people testified in his favor saying, we have never seen it like this in Israel before. So as the Passover season began that year, expectation reached its peak. Luke describes the depth of the people's feeling, the intensity of their emotion in verse 37. He says, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Not understanding what was waiting for Jesus We could imagine that the crowds wanted him to use his power to deliver them from the Romans by calling down fire from heaven. We know that at least once before, a crowd had tried to compel Jesus forcibly to become king. Well, this was the perfect time for it at the Passover, or so they thought. Hadn't the prophets foretold that the Messiah would stand upon the Mount of Olives as Jesus did that morning and then fight against the nations with the armies of heaven? After all, what else could there possibly be left for Jesus to do? But that day Jesus came riding not on a white horse, but on the colt of a donkey. It was the way that Israelite kings used to ride in times of peace. He was fulfilling a prophecy that day, but not the prophecies of judgment. Instead, he was giving them the sign that he had come to make peace. Zechariah the prophet had foreseen it five centuries before. He said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus was coming to them in humility, coming to make peace between his heavenly father and a wayward human race. The crowd acclaimed him as the son of David, Israel's Messiah. It meant that they believed he was God's chosen king, anointed to bring deliverance to the people. And so they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, a phrase that means save us now. We call it Palm Sunday, of course, because of the greeting that Jesus received. Waving palm branches and making a carpet out of your garments was the traditional way to greet victorious kings. Most of that palm-waving crowd was rejoicing over Jesus with shouts of praise. To be sure, there were some who were offended, as we saw. But there was one man present who was overcome with sorrow, and that was Jesus himself. You see, Jesus saw what no one else saw. Jesus was seeing the looming shadow of a cross. Jesus knew what no one else knew. He knew the spiritual needs of the people. He knew their need for wholeness. Jesus understood what nobody else there understood, that there was a heaven to be gained first for us before this world could be remade into something better. You know, this was probably the only time an entire city turned out for a parade without really knowing why. And so as Jerusalem came into view, Jesus began to weep. And the Greek text here indicates by weeping that this was more than just having a little bit of moisture, you know, in the corner of your eye. 
It was crying with audible sounds. It was heartfelt sorrow. And as he wept, Jesus explained the reason for his tears. He was longing for the people to grasp the things that would make for their peace. Jesus said, if only you could understand what would bring you peace. I have good news for you today, church. In fact, I have the best news imaginable. Jesus is looking out over our city today. He's looking out over our homes and over our hearts, and he's saying, I have come to you today with an offer of peace. I've come with an offer of friendship from the God of heaven to you. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus is saying to you and to me today, I want you to understand the things that will bring you peace. What are those things? I see three things here in the Palm Sunday story that will bring us peace and wholeness, and I want to share them with you. Three things that we need to do to experience that peace of God and abundant life. And the first one is this, welcome Jesus as God's appointed deliverer. Welcome Jesus as God's appointed deliverer. You know, if that Palm Sunday crowd was right about anything, it was this. They knew that Jesus had been sent to demonstrate the power of the kingdom of God. Jesus performed signs and wonders throughout Israel, showing that he was the one sent by God to set the captives free, operating in the power of heaven. You remember that Jesus began his public ministry by saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And we see in the gospels three aspects to this in his ministry. First, that Jesus was the prophet of God. Jesus revealed the secrets of men's hearts. The Bible says that Jesus did not need anyone to tell him what was in men's hearts because he knew what was in the heart of men. A woman of Samaria said about him, come, see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Peter came to Jesus one day because he was having a little bit of trouble with the tax man. And Jesus already knew why he'd come. Jesus called people by name whom he had never met. Jesus could uncover men's sins if he needed to, but he preferred to show a disciple like Nathaniel that he knew all about Nathaniel's secret prayer life. Jesus lived in perfect communion with his heavenly Father. And so Matthew gives us the additional Palm Sunday detail that as Jesus rode into the city, the crowds were saying, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. Not only is he the prophet of God, Jesus was the great physician. He came with healing in his wings. People watched, amazed, as the dead were raised to life, the lepers were made whole, and the paralytics got up and followed him. Deaf people heard again, and people born blind began to see. When Jesus healed people, he was showing us the heart of a loving God. When a man said, Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean, Jesus replied, I am willing, you be made clean. And yet we know only a fragment of the miracles that he did. John said if everything that Jesus did, all of his wonderful works were written down, he said, I suppose the whole world itself could not contain the books that would be required to hold those mighty deeds. Jesus was God's appointed deliverer. He was a prophet. He was a healer. And he was also the divine invader. Jesus came to set the captives free. He showed his absolute authority over every unclean spirit of hell, up to and including Satan himself. The Bible says, for this reason, Jesus, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Matthew recorded in his gospel how Jesus could cast out demons all night long. He said, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick, so that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and carried our sicknesses away. 
Peter saw Jesus break the chains off tormented minds. And when he was asked to explain the ministry of Jesus to unbelievers, he gave an answer which maybe you and I would not give. Peter said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing everyone who was oppressed by the devil because God was with him. No power of hell could stand against the Savior. Jesus said, I watched as Satan fell like lightning from heaven. This ministry of Jesus, the Deliverer, still continues. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still heals the broken bodies. He still gives a word by His Holy Spirit that will open the hearts of men and women. His name still sends the powers of hell fleeing in terror. Many of you here can testify of his delivering power. Sometimes he uses no human agents to help in his work, but other times people are set free through the authority that he gave his church, commissioning us to heal and to cast out demonic spirits. Jesus has set so many captives free, and he can do the same for you. What is it that's plaguing you today? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Is it mental instability? Jesus can heal you and set you free. Will you receive him today? Will you welcome him as the deliverer? We sang it this morning and said, We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, save me now. We're talking about three things that will bring us peace. The first one is to welcome him. Welcome Jesus as God's appointed deliverer. The second thing we need to do is this. Welcome Jesus as God's anointed king. We need to welcome him as God's anointed king. That common title that we give him, Messiah, means anointed one. You know, in ancient times, the kings were anointed with oil as a sign that the Holy Spirit had come upon them to empower them for their mission and to signify that they had been set apart as being specially chosen. Messiah is a Hebrew word, of course, and when we translate that into Greek, it comes down to us as the word Christos or Christ. So church, remember that every time you say Jesus Christ, what are you saying? You're saying Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus is the king that God has chosen. He's the one upon whom God has set his seal of approval. He's the son of God. He's the captain of the host. He's the commander of the armies of heaven. He's our lawgiver. He's our judge. And everything obeys him by the father's decree. The father said in Hebrews chapter 1, Let all the angels of God worship him. Philippians chapter 2, we read that God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus said all, everybody say all. All, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And this explains how we welcome him as king. Church, we never will experience God's peace until and unless we are ready to obey Jesus Christ. Unless we obey his voice, we will never experience abundant life. We need to welcome Jesus as God's anointed king, a king who is fully entitled to rule my life, who is completely authorized to be my leader and to be my captain. Can we welcome him as God's anointed king? This is an important question for the last days. Many of us can see the signs of the times. We watch the news, we hear the news, people send us articles, we talk about it amongst ourselves, say, look at what's going on in the world. Jesus must be coming soon. But have we really considered what it means to be a last day's people? Have we realized yet that there is only wisdom and safety 
in obeying his word, the commands of God's anointed king. We live in an independent age in which every man is encouraged to follow his own counsel and not to inquire of the Lord like the holy men of old. We need to look to his words, which Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Moses gathered the people together and said, these are the words which the Lord commanded us to do. God told Joshua in the following generation, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but in it you shall meditate day and night so that you may observe, be careful to do everything that is contained within it. Then Jesus himself came among us and said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will compare him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. How many of you know in that story, the flood and the winds came to both kinds of houses? But Jesus said it did not fall because it was founded. It was built upon a rock. Follow the word of the Lord. Honor the word of the Lord. Be willing to obey the word of the Lord. We used to sing a song way back. If you don't have a willing heart, ask him to give you one. See, the world is beginning to despise his ways, church. Do you know that? But the only thing that will keep us safe is to build our lives upon his word and decide that God's way is the best way. Let's leave this mindset behind that says, well, pastor, I know what the Bible says, but... See, when we pick and choose between the commandments of the Lord, I can hear again the sound of Jesus in his Palm Sunday lament, saying, oh, if only you knew what blessedness could be yours. If only you knew the things that would bring you peace. If we call him Lord, then let us honor him as the one who has the right to rule. Experience his abundant life this Palm Sunday. Just as Jesus proved himself to be God's appointed deliverer, there are many testimonies I know in this room of how people began to be blessed once they started to do it God's way. They found a better pathway for themselves and for their families. Maybe you knew this truth at one time and you wandered away from it. Maybe you're someone who constructed a life for yourself, free of God's interference. But now you've discovered that there really isn't any peace in it. Or maybe you've never really known God in a personal way and you're wondering if Jesus can help you in your situation. He will receive you and he can help you. Jesus said, take my yoke, my burden upon you. Learn from me. You will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Will you receive him? Will you welcome him as king and say, I welcome you, Jesus. I acknowledge you as Lord and I surrender to your kingship. Come and teach me how to live. Three things that will bring us peace this Palm Sunday. Welcome Jesus as God's deliverer. Welcome him as God's anointed king. And third, welcome Jesus as God's accepted lamb. We need to welcome Jesus as God's accepted lamb. This was the great mystery of Palm Sunday. It was something that was hidden away from the crowds. Jesus was not riding that morning into Jerusalem as the lion of the tribe of Judah, trampling his enemies under his feet. He was coming as the Lamb of God, coming to take away the sins of the world. Yeah, go ahead and praise him. But if anyone did have ears to hear that Sunday, that mystery would have been revealed because there was another loud sound there was another noise in the city. 
that the people could have heard once the shouting died down. And that was the sound of sheep. The Passover was coming on Thursday night. And so the men of Israel were preparing to slaughter and eat the Passover lambs by the thousands. The number of lambs was staggering. In the generation just after Jesus, a couple of decades after the time of the Lord, we're told that the Romans were curious and they made an investigation as to how many Passover lambs were slaughtered. And the number came to about 250,000. Literally millions of people because there, you had to have at least 10 in a household to partake of one lamb. So there were at least a couple of million people who would have been eating the Passover in and around Jerusalem. And in the law of Israel, God gave specific instructions to the people how the Passover should be eaten, but also when. The Passover was celebrated on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. That's not the car company. This only has one S. The car has two S's. Passover was celebrated on the 14th of Nisan, but something important happened a few days earlier on the 10th of the month. On the 10th of Nisan, the Israelites were commanded to bring the lambs into their homes, into their dwellings. In Exodus chapter 12, God said to Moses, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, a lamb for a household. And the 10th day of Nisan, because of that, was called Lamb Selection Day. A lamb was brought into the home on the 10th, and it was inspected to make sure that it had no blemishes. It would live with the family during that Passover week, and they would begin to grow attached to it. On that particular year, the 10th of Nisan happened to fall upon a Sunday. In fact, it was Palm Sunday. And so, while the Passover lambs were being brought into the city of Jerusalem, while they were being brought in from the sheepfolds in nearby Bethlehem, where they were raised, God's Passover lamb, also born in Bethlehem, was coming into Jerusalem as well. What a God, what a plan. Jesus was inspected that day, like every lamb was. As he came into the city on Lamb Selection Day, the people saw that he had no blemish. And just a few days later, Pontius Pilate would look at him and say, I find no fault in him. He was the spotless Lamb of God, tempted, the Bible says, in all ways, just as we are, and yet without sin. He lived among the people that week in just the same way that the Passover lamb lived in the Jewish home with the Jewish family and became a pet for the children. Every day of that Passion Week, Jesus was teaching the people and just like the lamb in the household, they grew accustomed to his face and to his voice. On the original Passover, you know, the Israelites placed the blood of a lamb upon the doorposts because God had said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so it is with Christ. Upon the cross of Calvary, God placed your sins and mine upon Jesus, the innocent lamb. The God of glory allowed himself to be bound so that we could go free. The judge of Israel allowed himself to be struck upon the cheek so that we could be healed. The Bible says we deserved the penalty of death for our sins, but thank God it also says that God laid upon him, upon Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Because of that, death can now pass over us just the same way as it passed over the children of Israel on the night of the Exodus. When we apply the blood of Jesus not to a door of wood, but to the door of our hearts, God will pass over us. He will not enter any longer into judgment with us. And ex instead, he extends to us his offer of forgiveness and peace. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe in his sacrifice, then the holy God 
who says he must punish sin, has already expended all of his righteous wrath against you. You see, he poured out all of his wrath for sin upon his own son, who endured it all voluntarily for you and me. The Bible says scarcely for a righteous man, somebody will die. Maybe for a good man, perhaps someone might be willing to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus in our place. This is the good news of the gospel. This is why the gospel is good news. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. Jesus was God's accepted lamb. Will you receive Jesus today as your deliverer and your king? Will you receive him as God's lamb, the sacrifice that God accepted on your behalf? None of us can earn God's heaven. Even the most moral among us has fallen short many times of the demands of God's law. There is no sacrifice of blood or money that can open heaven's door to any man. But oh, thank God, there is a sacrifice that he has already accepted. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Yes. Worship team, come and help me if you would, please. So church, in closing today, I want to urge each and every one of us to come to him. Or for some of us, maybe, to come back to him. Jesus said that morning, if you had known, especially in this your day, the things that would make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. There is a day that can come to us. There is a day, there is an appointment which we dare not miss. Jesus is riding past us today, just as he rode past the crowd on the 10th day of Nisan, Palm Sunday. The Spirit of God is whispering to our hearts this morning the same thing that He whispered on that first Palm Sunday. This is the Deliverer that can set you free. This is the King whose words you need to give heed to. This is the acceptable sacrifice that can take away your guilt. How will we respond? The Bible says, if today you hear His voice, harden not your hearts. Jesus said that day was a special day, and indeed it was. And he didn't elaborate, but he said it was an appointed day, and he said it was their day. You know, there's a tremendous Bible prophecy that Jesus fulfilled that morning. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel 9, we read about how the prophet Daniel was told by the angel Gabriel that God was giving Israel a special mission. You can read the description there later on. We don't have, have time to drill into it this morning. But God was giving Israel 490 years to fulfill that mission. Now here's what we need to know. Don't get caught up in the numbers. But the angel told Daniel that after 483 of those years had expired, the Messiah would come and be slain. But the angel said, not for himself. Now that's an amazing prediction. And most of our Jewish friends don't know that their own Hebrew scriptures prophesied hundreds of years before that Messiah would be killed, killed for other people. But here's what's maybe an even more amazing part about that. The angel also told Daniel when that countdown would start so that a person might be able to count forward from that time that God predicted, count forward that 483 years. And when we do that, we discover an astonishing thing. Those 483 years when Messiah would come and be killed began in the time of Nehemiah. But they end on a very important date. And it's the date we've been talking about all morning. You see, the Bible scholars tell us that those 483 years ended in the year Jesus died. When? 
on the 10th day of Nisan, on Lamb Selection Day. In other words, the prophecy of Daniel 9 expired on Palm Sunday, just as the people were receiving Jesus and proclaiming him as Messiah of Israel. And just five days, you know the story. Of course, he would be killed, but not for himself. Think about that, church. Not only did Daniel predict the general time frame that Jesus would be proclaimed as Messiah and offered to the nation, he got it down to the exact day. But we know what happened. Most of Israel missed that appointed day. And so tragically, Jesus' prophecies of judgment came to pass. The Romans would soon destroy the holy city of God. And less than 40 years later, they literally dug a trench all the way around Jerusalem, just as Jesus had predicted, a trench that ran for miles. And the purpose of that trench was to keep everyone trapped inside Jerusalem until they starved to death. And as Jesus also said, the temple was so thoroughly destroyed in that next generation that literally not one stone was left standing on top of another stone. Jesus said, if you had known, especially in this, your day, the things that would bring you peace. Palm Sunday was their day. It was a prophesied day, which proves that the Bible is real, that the Bible is true. It proves that Jesus is Messiah of Israel, who came in the right way, in the right time, in the right place. It was their day. But they missed their appointment. But now church, today, today is your day. The Messiah has come to you today and he's offering to you peace. Jesus of Nazareth wants to be your healer today. Will you receive God's appointed deliverer? Jesus of Nazareth wants to be your king today. He wants your life to be blessed as you obey his words of life. Will you receive him as God's anointed king? And Jesus wants to be your savior today. He wants you to be born again and receive newness of life through trusting in the sacrifice of his blood that he made upon the cross on Good Friday. Will you receive God's accepted lamb? Today, Jesus is looking out at us, at you and me with love, the way that he looked out over the city that he loved so much. And now he wants us to know his peace. Will you welcome him? 